Hello, neuroplasticians. I'm very excited to be here with Stephanie Onesian. Stephanie, how are you today? I'm well, my friend. How are you? I'm delighted to have you on the call. Your smile is as big as your expertise. I'm really <laughs> interested to learn more about you and your work. So thank you for joining the, the neuroplasticity industry and the intention to make it a brain-based toolkit. But I'm really interested to learn about you and your work, Stephanie. So maybe introduce yourself into the discussion and we can go from there. That sounds okay. It's an honor. Thank you so much. Yes. I Hi, community, everyone. My name is Stephanie. I'm uh, from Los Angeles, actually uh, somewhat of a global uh, resident, but this has been my home base and where I've grown up for the majority of my life. And uh, I started this venture uh, from over a decade now of learning. And uh, this has always been an applied sort of topic that I've brought into different arenas of my work. Um, and really the foundation of it was basically looking at the deepest part of the origin of how we are behaving. Um, and from my own experience, um, I'm a only child of two immigrants here to the US from two different parts of the world. That was really the cornerstone of my interest. Okay, so behaviorally, why are we acting how we do? How much of it is really our emotion and how much of it is inherited, frankly? Mm -hmm. um, and the crux of that is what I've really based my business on, which is burnout and stress. Um, really foundationally speaking, what takes us over the edge to where we're not able to function optimally anymore? Well, how, um, does that work, how does that work in relationship to the brain, in relationship to neuroplasticity? What is your insight in that area, Stephanie? Well, you know, it's interesting because at this stage in the research, the label of stress is really such an all-encompassing oh, disease, right. actually. And it can be documented as and labeled as such, um, or at least the precursor to a um, plethora of unknowns, right? So how do we mitigate stress? How do we regulate the stress? Um, and what is actually happening in our bodies and minds that takes us over the edge where we can't end that kind of stress cycle? Why are mm -hmm. we always on, so to speak? Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of that, and as I said, came from my own experience and observing others in mm -hmm. their behavior of constantly being re reactive instead of reflexive, um, not truly processing what's happening externally and having these autopilot responses to things, which I found fascinating. Um, yes. This, it, yes. My, my interest in stress medicine, as is probably the best phrase, comes out by being a in a startup in New York many years ago, which ended up building a product called the Stress Eraser, which was, uh, a, a, was a good enough name at the time, but it was, a, it was a tool to improve your HRV, your heart rate variability. And we looked at how eustress, eustress can be useful and how distress can cause chronic disease and how how damaging stress is and when you you speak about burnout isn't that too late to help a person what do you do when burnout's on the table it well and that's that's the fear right and that's the absolute concern burnout is when you've completely shut down and your hyper arousal state is on fire yeah, exactly. it, you're done you're done you're fried to a crisp um and the the part of that that is exciting is that we can always get back to that sort of level of optimum functioning again it's right. not hopeless it's not a hopeless case burnout is that ultimate alarm bell that sounded that you cannot go any further in the way it's, that you're going 
You didn't have any burnout. Did you have a burnout or did you keep yourself together? Are you okay? You've never had uh, burnout. I, I actually I was hospitalized because of it. Oh, no. and story. That sounds terrible. It was, it was, uh, and again, this is sort of that aha moment that I had. Um, I had been working in a job that I absolutely loved, but there were holes in the organization, there were holes in management. Um, not to blame that, that is an external factor. Uh, it got to the point where I did not have boundaries. I was not able to say no anymore because, again, and this goes back to this epigenetic sort of generational learning that I've attached to the right. programs I've built. Um, and I ended up hospitalized. My body literally froze. It was every muscle in my body stopped working. I couldn't walk anymore. Um, oh. Every kind of mechanism that was fun trying to function in my body mind had shut down. Um, and the only advice I had gotten from the doctor was, you're going to quit your job or you're going to die. It was that bad. Um, and so because of this curiosity, I really had to look at myself and figure out, wait a minute, where is this coming from? It couldn't all be blamed on the external. It had to be what was I reacting to that wasn't aligning to the external. So do you think it was the way you were wired? Do you think it was the way that your epigenetic profile had been conditioned. Is that what your thinking is? That was that was the hypothesis. And that's what I spent years and years doing deep dives on and going to research facilities, running different hypotheses, experimenting on myself, experimenting on others. And yes, that was the conclusion that actually this sort of inherited pattern of behavior had really influenced how I would automatically respond to certain stimuli or stressors that were outside of myself. So do you think like certain cultures or communities are less resilient? Do you think certain profiles of people show more vulnerability? What do you notice in your work, Stephanie? Well, it's interesting because, you know, culturally speaking, this is all, this works hand in hand. Uh, you know, you'll see, let's say in a global company, and again, I hate to stereotype, but more for observational purposes, let's say an American conglomerate is usually very outspoken, right? They have a different way of doing business. Um, mm. Whereas let's say the Far East, very much a more muted way of communicating in, in their value system, in the way that uh, they approach a hierarchical element of um, a company, let's say, if we're talking about business. And so even those two differentiations could potentially butt heads and one could feel overwhelmed by the other. And there's there's a missing link there somewhere. How are we communicating with each other where we're not lacking in our own authenticity? Because if we keep suppressing how we would optimally function what is truly our own behavior we're constantly being overridden by somebody else's behavior and fundamentally at some point we're going to crack um and you know looking back at let's say i'll take myself for an example coming from my father middle eastern my mother northern european um there was and coming also from historically war-ridden countries, um, there was a sense of keep your mouth shut because that is avoiding a threat on the external, right? And that was historically how they were raised for survival. There was no choice in that. And so they, they manipulated their personalities, understandably so, to survive, very right. simply put. And so generationally, as those kind of things are embedded into us, and now that we know it's embedded into our DNA, and we have this system of methylation that comes in, which turns off or turns on what genes are expressed, dependent on the situation, then we are at risk to continue certain behaviors that may not be necessary anymore. And we are at risk for autopilot reactions that may be 
pushing our adrenaline to such a level that we don't actually need to express 50 years so, ago. So do, you, do you work like with personality profiles or you work with cultural sensitization? Where, where, where is your sweet spot? I'm so interested to know how you apply this. It's so interesting. I mean, it's fascinating because the sweet spot has to be guided by the individual, right? And we don't want to start out in a negative framework. We okay. we want to start out with what are the positives in where you think you're coming from historically. Let's talk about the good stuff, the strengths, but also having to dig a bit and say, all right, culturally speaking, where do you align? How, how do you think uh, you are operating? And then you go a little bit deeper. All right, familial speaking. What, what traits are you loving? What traits do you actually, and there's a process for this, obviously, because we walk a fine line between not therapizing, um, but digging and kind of coaxing the answers out of a client. But really, let's find the awareness. That's that sweet spot, that aha moment where, oh, wait a minute, maybe I had been reacting based on how I've been taught. Um, is this working for me? And ultimately, how do I control that, take a beat, and really retrain, rewire my brain so that I'm thinking for myself based on what I know today, what is needed today. And yeah, I think culturally speaking, it's huge. That is a huge portion of it. Um, celebrating the culture, but also realizing that some of these things might not be relevant for your life today. Um, so so do, like, does any of the burnout come when a person feels like a, like a fish out of water, when they're in an environment where they just don't connect, where they don't feel, you know, at home? Is that, is that, is that a part of the, the, the burnout that you do? Or is, is it more about something else? It's the perception of that. And how are you perceiving yourself in any given environment and realizing that there has to be a collaboration as you work in the world, but where is that perception in your mind? Where do I fit in? Perhaps the assumptions that are made in perceiving how you think you might be a fish out of water, uh, to your point, because we have more in common than we are different in so many ways. But for instance, we're not always going to have the luxury of changing our environment whenever we feel like we're on the verge of burning out. Many people, most people don't have that option to say, all right, I'm feeling like I'm on the cusp of frying here in my current job. Here's my two weeks notice, I'm out. Very few people can do that. And so, if they can, if they can, will that make a difference? Well, if they can, of absolutely. I mean, you're thinking of uh, a complete option to change your life, and that again goes back to wait a minute. What have I been taught? Again, what are the expectations that have been put upon me versus what are the expectations I'd like to place on myself? It could be completely different, or maybe mm -hmm. not but you have to be able to regulate yourself and kind of adjust that perception and be able to then ideally perception into communication, into mm -hmm. a different curiosity for the other. And yeah, then and being able to- We've done any work with cognitive bias and heuristics. Have you come across that body of work at all? I mean, we've looked in here into heuristics and you know, it's interesting because we cannot mind read, right? And we have to be able to study something at least to the point where we have some kind of cornerstone in, ah, wait a minute, this is actually something we can test, something we can look at and say, all right, there's a trend that we actually should measure on a power curve, if anything else, to really negate the negate what the assumptions are right and there's enough research that we've been able to 
to do. And again, going back to culture, we're always sort of divvying people up by community and looking at the auto responses. And actually, very interestingly, we're uh, a few colleagues and I are now putting together a nonprofit for uh, refugee work in Kenya. And we're starting our pilot program uh, looking at different co communities and tribes in the Kakuma refugee camp for in this is sort of our our pilot uh, controlled group and there are at least six different communities within this organ this camp of over 200,000 people this is a fantastic way to study in the same environment versus cultural differences every group is stressed to the max because of external factors. But how are they regulating themselves in their own community? How are they regulating their own family? Um, and looking at their auto responses, because obviously that is an extreme. They've been, all of them, equally exposed to the same amount of trauma. So interesting where different brains go based on how they were raised. Um, and really it's this concept of nature versus nurture, but the ultimate factor is at the end, all of them have these different ideas of burnout and they're all struggling. So which, which country has the best kind of brain? I'm just saying, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> let's <laughs> research that. <laughs> oh, that just being, me being or funny. the most disciplined brain, frankly, or the most disciplined brain. Um, I spend a lot of time in Germany, and those the discipline in that space is is claustrophobic. Anyway, that's a conversation for another time. I think I think I think there's a, a lot of stuff we can explore in the community here, Stephanie. I think there's a lot of understanding of how influences from an early age wire our brains to have certain social and emotional triggers. Um, I think there's so much work to do here. Well, the first seven years of life, you're a sponge. You're a total sponge. And and there are different sort of activators that have not yet been realized in a young mind. And you are the uh, the most efficient observer as a young child. And so you are observing directly the behavior that had, had come before you. And of course, this is nothing new, but it's it's the concept of what's happening and what happens after age seven. Mm. Um, and mm. This idea of, all right, how much are you allowed to realize your own thought process as pr processes as opposed to what you've already been taught. And the majority of your reactions from there on out are at subconscious behaviors. So it's this concept of genetic determinism. What, what is it and not gonna move? And what are those patterns and behavioral sort of behavioral responses that you can actually shift? And there, we are so plastic in that way. It's just this lack of understanding that we have more control over that than we realize. And then we get into adulthood and we're responding to bosses, we're responding to our partners, we're responding to our friendship groups in perhaps a way that isn't optimal, right? Are you saying yes when actually you wanna say no? And over a course of time, this repetitive negation will absolutely exhaust your mind. And is is there a field called neuroanthropology? Is that a there, thing? <laughs> it is ab absolutely it's a thing. And it mm. is it that is in a sense, that is exactly what we're doing, right? They're doing it's this concept of doing the digging, <laughs> anthropologically speaking, um, uh, in your own brain. Uh, and coming to this aha moment and trying to do it in this positive emotional reception kind of reception instead of painting a negative picture of oh okay my parents did this oh uh, no that's not the, that's it, not it. It, because it becomes a blame game very quickly doesn't it absolutely and that's i think why this work ideally at this stage in the game must be guided 
And it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there needs to be some kind of help to say, all right, I'll stop you right there. How are we pivoting this perception? Because ultimately, as we all know, you're not going to rewire anything until your perception changes. Pivoting perception is at the key, at the kernel, at the core of everything neuroplasticity based. You know, if you don't change your mind, you won't change your brain. And if you don't change your brain, you won't change your behavior. And off goes the, the conversation. I don't know, I really want to explore this with you further, Stephanie. It'd be so nice to have a round table with everybody to look at the neuroanthropology of burnout or whatever we call it. I don't mind. Yes, that's a wonderful term. I would absolutely love that. And I think what I would love to explore with the community too is this sense of change is nearly impossible, right? And that's sort of the, the phrase of phrases. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to prove that wrong. And change is 100% possible. We all know this. What will get us to the point of feeling vulnerable enough that we allow the change, where we can activate enough of this new rewiring so we can lessen the threat put our guard down a bit and be able to receive this new information. And that's really that point of interest that I'd love to go deeper in with the community. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'd love to have, I'd love to have this conversation. I could, I could speak to you all day, but let's call really? it quick. Let's call it quick. <laughs> I don't want to let you go, but I, I've taken enough of your time. So it's been a long conversation, but it's been um, hypnotic really. And as I'm, I love the work that you're doing, Stephanie, I think we're all going to have, Great fun diving deep into oh. your brain and we're going to definitely learn something and share ideas together. So once again, thank you so much for being on the channel. It's so much fun having you in the community and yeah, I'm looking forward to our next steps together. Oh, Thanks very so much. much so. Thank you so much. Can't wait. Take care. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.